welcome. I'm Joyce Sin, and here's what happened this week. Taiwan and the Pacific Island nation of Nauru have ended diplomatic relations. The two countries established diplomatic ties in 2005. The news comes two days after Taiwan's presidential elections, which saw the ruling DPP candidate Lai Ching De win. Taiwan now has only 12 remaining diplomatic allies. To dig deeper into what the loss of relations with Nauru means for Taiwan, I spoke with Yan Zhenshen, a professor of international affairs at National Zhengzi University. Now that Nauru has broken diplomatic ties, Taiwan is at a historic low with just 12 allies. How big of an impact does Nauru leaving have on Taiwan's foreign affairs? Uh, a, a country like Nauru, so small in the Pacific Island, probably can be explained away. But this will not be able to explain the, away the fact that we have lost 10 diplomatic allies since Tsai Ing-wen took office and since Lai ching -de already pledged to continue to toy the line of Tsai Ing-wen, I don't think there will be any dialogue or interaction with Beijing. We will continue to lose diplomatic ally. But I didn't expect it come so fast. In just a few hours later, you learn about Nauru. But this, I think, is what China has worked on before the election, uh, but just waiting for the result of the election. So it can, you know, use that to uh, maybe making a statement about, uh, you know, the, the, the reaction of Beijing is a continuation of poaching Taiwan's diplomatic ally since uh, we have elected a DPP government. China has been trying to increase its influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Do you think China establishing ties with Nauru shows Beijing's strategic interests there, or is it really just about Taiwan? I don't know whether China is trying you know, to make a statement of just like they are trying to uh, uh, get uh, Switzerland or Eswatini to their side so that have you know, a complete sweep of the African continent. Do they have complete sweep of the Pacific Island in mind? I'm not sure. But strategically, Nauru is not as important. But the more important thing is uh, it does uh, represent uh, that Australia, the country, the, the power in the region uh, cannot stop or cannot keep uh, the Pacific Island country from moving to Beijing's side, just like the U.S. cannot stop the Latin American uh, ally of Taiwan to switch uh, diplomatic recognition. You mentioned Taiwan losing many of its allies under DPP presidencies. And now that Lai ching -te has secured a historic third straight term for the party, what do you see being the worst case scenario for Taiwan's diplomatic relations? Worst case scenario is we will have probably a single digit of diplomatic allies. Our government has, to me, they have anticipated this. So in the past few years, I can see that we have uh, uh, moved on to, to more important uh, substantial relation with non-diplomatic allies. But without the diplomatic allies uh, in the Caribbean or Central America, uh, our president cannot even have a transit stop in the U.S then we would truly be isolated. That was Yan Zhenshen, international affairs professor at National Zhengzi University. With the severing of ties, Nauru and students on scholarships in Taiwan now face an uncertain future. A reporter, Reese Ayers, went to one of the universities that has several Nauru students to see how the school is responding. Now, when a country severs diplomatic ties with Taiwan, some of the first people to feel the effects of that are students, particularly those studying on scholarships. Now, there are over 50 students from Nauru studying in Taiwan, and 30 of those have scholarships from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, whether or not those students will be able to continue studying is still yet to be decided. Now, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has urged any universities in Taiwan with students from Nauru to offer them the care and guidance they need to get through this difficult time. Mingchuan University has a total of 15 students from Nauru, and this school is going to do everything they can to try and help them. 
right now that they, I think it takes time for them to really uh, adjust their steps and think of what they want to do in the future. Most of them, actually all of them are the scholarship students. So they need to you know, consider how they can continue their schools in Taiwan. Um, sometimes there might be some scholarships you know, from somewhere else or hopefully or, you know, their countries might provide some you know, um, next steps you know, for them. Yeah, so we will continue, we will just you know, try to maintain, uh, I mean, have an open communications with the students and then take care of, of them. Now, Taiwan has steadily been losing diplomatic allies over the past few years and decades. The last one to go was Honduras in 2023. Now, when that happened, uh, Honduran students actually got together. They made groups. Uh, they got their parents involved uh, and they petitioned the Honduran government to try and uh, get funding for them to finish their programs in Taiwan if they so wished. Some students actually chose to go over to China to finish their programs there. Now, once the shock for the Nauruan students currently studying in Taiwan has subsided, they will face similar decisions about whether or not they want to continue their studies here if they can, or if they want to go over to China to continue programs there. Eason Chen and Reese's for Taiwan Plus. China has officially reacted to the election of the DPP's Lai Qingde as Taiwan's next president. But as Rosie Greninger explains, some people in China are hopeful for peaceful cross-strait relations. Two days since Taiwan elected Lai Qingde of the Democratic Progressive Party to rule the nation, China is reaffirming its claim on the country. Avoiding taking aim directly at the DPP, which is taking an unprecedented third term in power, Beijing is warning Taiwan not to push for independence, saying its One China principle is a solid anchor for peace across the Taiwan Strait. Taiwan but on the streets of Shanghai and Hong Kong, more optimistic views of collaboration. Taiwan depends heavily on trade with China, and Lai has been making efforts to soften his earlier stance for independence knowing he has to find a way to work with the country's cross-strait neighbour without upsetting the status quo. I think uh, uh, the, uh, basically the uh, uh, policy, foreign policy, cross-strait relations will remain the same. But it, it very much depends upon Xi Jinping's attitude, I would say. But with President-elect Lai, Beijing's least preferred choice, vowing to safeguard Taiwan's democracy, the Chinese leader's attitude towards the island nation may not be so diplomatic. Ryan Wu and Rosie Greninger for Taiwan Plus. What everyone knows is true. Taiwan's housing is well beyond affordable, and it's getting worse. As John Van Trias reports, it's one of the first challenges President-elect Lai Qingde will face. Home ownership is slipping further out of reach for many in Taiwan even though new units like these are always under construction. Fresh figures from the Interior Ministry show Taiwan's lack of affordable housing is getting worse. In the third quarter of 2023, homeowners were spending over 42 percent of their income on mortgage repayments. Go back just two years to the same part of 2021, and that was just 37 percent. Taiwan has long been an expensive place to buy property. The capital Taipei rivals New York in terms of the mortgage burden. But prices have reached a point where some find even the idea of buying a home unthinkable. And it's not just Taipei. Just three regions of the country have housing considered affordable. That's to say that mortgages are less than 30 percent of income. There's the city of Keelung near Taipei, and then the largely rural Jiayi and Pingdong counties in the south. The case is political, and it was one of the big issues in Saturday's election. For two years, the government has tried to crack down on investment properties, something it's blamed for high prices. One NGO advocating for affordable housing says the fact prices are still rising might have cost the ruling DPP around two million votes from young people. 
等社会住宅等不到。我会觉得说，在这个房价的结这样的问题没有去解决的时候，你怎么指望我们的年轻人可以买得起？你怎么指望我们今天公布的那个房价指数可负担性可以出来？ That's a challenge Taiwan's next government must face. The DPP has won another presidential term, and now it has big promises to deliver on. President-elect Lai Qingde has promised higher taxes on owners of multiple homes, and he's promised subsidies to help with interest on home loans. While overseas observers look to Lai's China policy, at home it's his housing policy many will be watching more closely. They'll be looking to see whether he keeps his promises and whether his ideas work. Alex Chen and John Van Trieste in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Taiwanese investment in China plummeted nearly 40 percent last year to more than a 20-year low. The economy ministry here says Taiwan's businesses invested around 3 billion U.S. dollars in China in 2023, the lowest amount since 2002. The number of Taiwanese investment projects in China also dropped by around 10 percent. It comes as Taiwan seeks to diversify its trade and investment away from China by developing economic relations with other countries. Beijing has a record of using economic measures to put pressure on Taiwan. To learn more about what declining investment means for Taiwan and China, our reporter Jeremy Olivier spoke with the Economist Intelligence Unit's lead analyst for global trade, Nick Morrow. So Taiwanese investment has been on a general downward trend since it hit its peak around 2010 to 2011. You know, but 40% is a, is a pretty big decline. So why did we see such a big drop last year? If you look into the data, we first started to see outward investment towards destinations that are not China really start to pick up um, around 2015, 2016, really eclipse the investment that was destined towards China. And that coincides with a period of realization by foreign companies in general that, for example, uh, manufacturing bases in Southeast Asia were just a lot more cost effective. But in the past couple of years, undoubtedly, it's tied to geopolitics and the risks tied to doing business in China, as well as the fact that the Chinese growth engine is somewhat sputtering at this moment. Foreign investors in general have become incredibly wary of the Chinese market because of the increasingly difficult operational considerations that are affecting their businesses, as well as the fact that uh, policy clarity is just worsening. So much of China's 21st century status as the factory of the world has been staked on the success of Taiwanese firms who are invested there. So what could this recent decline mean for the Chinese economy? I think maybe there are two things that we can look at in terms of what this means for the Chinese economy. The first is the fact that um, as the economy becomes a lot more closed off, um, this has ramifications for trade ties, ramifications for diplomatic relations, um, cross-strait linkages specifically in general um, are are very much bolstered by the fact that economic linkages between Taiwan and China are, are robust, and that has been a stabilizing force for, for both of those markets. China's industry is still relatively dependent on foreign inputs. Um, even its tech sector is still heavily reliant on Taiwanese chips and other intermediate components. And so if we start to see a fall off in you know, economic ties, specifically trade, but also investments, then there are questions around, you know, where can the Chinese tech sector go from here? Um, there is a strong push to replace Taiwanese products and Taiwanese businesses with, say, Chinese alternatives, but the verdict is still out in terms of how successful China will be able to actually achieve this goal. What could the exodus of um, investment by Taiwanese businesses mean for those those companies? There's a really strong wave of interest right now among Taiwanese businesses in looking further afield. We're seeing a lot of interest right now in Southeast Asia, but also places like Mexico, given the proximity to the U.S. market. I think a lot of Taiwanese investors are kind of waking up to this idea that as important as the Chinese market has been for their operations over the past couple of decades, it can no longer be the you know one-all, end-all. That was The Economist Intelligence Unit's Nick Morrow speaking with Jeremy Olivier. Thank you for watching. Here's what happened. You can visit the Taiwan Plus website or our social media for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Before we go, we leave you with images of the Nasada Light Festival being held in Thailand's Ratchaburi province. I'm Joyce Stone. Take care and see you next week.